Well, thank you very much indeed for that very kind and generous welcome to me. I'm glad to join in the list of Scots, real and imaginary, who have taken part in this series over the years. Looking back over the list, I saw that you had Lord George MacLeod of Funerary um, quite a number of years ago. You have had um, Robin Barber, who was my predecessor in New Testament in Aberdeen. You have had David Bevington, who, like me, is in that sort of adopted Scot, and I'm very pleased to join that great company. Over the past couple of decades, I've encountered several students who wished to do research in the that they called hermeneutics. This fact is one symptom of where we are at in biblical research at the present time. For sometimes it seemed to me that the students in question weren't sure exactly what they really wanted to do. Whether it was to attempt some fresh approach to a biblical passage or theme, or to discuss the broad principles <coughs> of interpretation. Now I'm going to try and be consistent, probably won't succeed, and use the term interpretation to refer to the formal activity where we are actually interpreting a biblical text. And to use the term hermeneutics to refer to the science or art of interpretation. So interpretation is what we do when we are actually dealing with the text. And hermeneutics is what we do when we talk about what we are doing when we do interpretation. <laughs> now, there's great uncertainty about this whole general area of hermeneutics and interpretation at the present time. Not only in the narrower sector of religious, of biblical studies rather, but also in the broader field of literary studies and philosophy, and even more widely. Biblical interpretation that once perhaps was almost taken for granted has come to the fore as a disputed topic that demands scholarly attention. And it's not surprising that in this situation there has been much fresh attention given to it within that branch of Christian faith and scholarship called evangelical. And it's within that context that I want to examine some key issues. But it's a very broad topic, and I want to limit it in various ways. First of all, galloping professional narrowness will force me to deal here primarily with problems arising in the area of the New Testament, rather than in the Bible as a whole. But what I have to say will hopefully represent the position regarding evangelical biblical studies generally. Then secondly, I want to look at the topic from a particular angle that will help to focus the discussion. Hermeneutics is particularly important to us, and I, I think I'm probably speaking for the audience as a whole, for two reasons. First of all, as Christian scholars who adhere to an evangelical faith, we are committed to the academic study of scripture within a, professional within a confessional framework. And therefore, we must consider how this situation both liberates and constrains us as we carry out the task. But then second, as for practicing Christians, we are also committed to Christian witness in the contemporary world. And therefore, we need to ask questions about how we discover the message of the Bible, both for our fellow believers, but also for our non-Christian neighbors, and how we convey it to them. Now, clearly, these two commitments to academic study and to Christian witness are interrelated. And it's increasingly recognized that we cannot separate them, the one from the other. Now, it is the latter task the one of expressing the Christian message for today, which is my particular focus in this series. And then perhaps a third limitation is that in these lectures, I'm going to be particularly concerned with the question of how we use our, the Bible in the three areas of theology, ecclesiology, the church, and ethics, but particularly in the first of these, namely theology. But before we get down to that specific theme, it may be helpful to 
put the latter into a broader context. So let me note that some of our problems as inter of interpretation as evangelicals and as Christians are shared with any scholars or readers of texts as these people attempt to understand what the texts say. But other problems arise from the fact that we are Christian believers for whom the Bible is somehow different from other books. And we think rightly that the way in which we interpret it is or should be different. What makes the Bible different from other books is, of course, that for us it is scripture, which signifies, among various things, that it possesses authority over its readers, speaking in the language to them of truth and command. Now, it's not only that this makes the question of what it says all the more important. If it is authoritative, we need to be as sure as possible what it is that God says to us by way of promise and warning, and what we are authoritatively called to believe and to do. And it's also the case, as I say, that there may be ways in which the process of interpretation is different simply because the Bible is scripture. If this is a book which is somehow authored by God, then an appropriate manner of interpretation is required. So let's look at what's involved in interpretation, and I'll begin by offering a brief analysis of the topic. The contemporary discussion of interpretation proceeds on three levels. The first of these is the level of general hermeneutics, which asks what is going on in interpretation in general and then in biblical interpretation in particular. Now clearly it's important to investigate hermeneutics at that level. Let me just mention by way of example two of the vital questions that would arise under this heading. First of all, there is the very important question of whether texts can have meaning in themselves a meaning that is objectively there, so to speak, in the book and contained in the book. Or is meaning something that is created afresh through the interaction between the reader and the text, so that texts in themselves have no fixed meaning? <coughs> Clearly, if that were the case, it would have considerable implications for our understanding of biblical authority. Is the authority in the text itself or is it somewhere else? And then second, at the same level of general hermeneutics, there is the question of how language and communication work. How do texts work? What is the role of an author? What is the role of the reader? And so on. Now, asking questions of that kind helps us to have some idea about what we may legitimately expect from different kinds of texts, how we should approach them, and the implications of this for recognizing what is actually going on in biblical texts and in our reading of them. Now, largely, perhaps mainly because of comparative ignorance of that area, but also perhaps, this is the, the, the spin on it, perhaps because it's less immediately fruitful for the nitty-gritty of biblical interpretation than the other two levels of study, I'm going to leave that one to one side, more or less. Then secondly, there is the level of exegesis, the word that we use for the specific <coughs> procedures that may be applied to textual study, such things as linguistic study, study of the context, source criticism, and much else. These methods and tools are used in approaching a text so as to understand it now as it was understand as it was understood or was meant to be understood in its own time. And then thirdly, there is the level that called exposition or application, where we raise the question of whether and how an ancient text can have something to say to contemporary readers as to us, as opposed to the original readers. Even if, say, Luke or Paul considered themselves to be writing scripture, 
in the sense of work spent for Christians <coughs> everywhere for the foreseeable future. It can be taken for granted, I think, that they did so within the boundaries of their own particular world. And they didn't foresee the world, the very different world, of which we are part. And therefore there is a legitimate and necessary question about how their works can continue to function as scripture for us today. Now obviously these three levels of discussion are inextricably bound up together with one another. A classic modern example of the interrelatedness might be perhaps Rudolf Bultmann, who read the New Testament in the light of the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, with the result that even in his New Testament theology, which is meant to be telling us what the New Testament writers said for their time, nevertheless we get a demythologized version of what they said. Bultmann, in other words, is setting out to some extent what Christians ought to believe today, rather than simply describing the theology of the New Testament on its own terms. Now, until comparatively recently, evangelicals, like biblical scholars and preachers generally, didn't recognize just how great the problems are in these three areas. Of course, there were handbooks of biblical interpretation. In my student days, for example, the British scholar Alan Stibbs wrote three little booklets for students at a fairly non-technical level, one of which was called Understanding God's Word. Some of us suggested at the time that he might also have written a book on liberal interpretation of the Bible, which would have been called Misunderstanding God's Word. A typical example of our juvenile pride and the typical evangelical claim that we alone are right and everybody else is wrong. Nevertheless, there was a growing awareness of the need for deeper discussion. A single example may suffice. Thirty years ago, we were no doubt influenced <coughs> by the mood of the times when the New Testament study group of the Tyndale Fellowship, the British equivalent of say, the Institute for Biblical Research, um, this group devoted its meeting in 1973, it's, it's pretty well 30 years ago, to this topic, and they discussed a set of papers which were eventually published in 1977 under the title New Testament Interpretation, Essays on Principles and Methods. Now, this book was intended to be a comprehensive introductory textbook for theological students. And in one of the essays in the book on approaches to New Testament exegesis, Ralph Martin commended what he called the grammatical historical method. He contrasted it with what he called the dogmatic approach and what he called the impressionistic approach. The former of these, the dogmatic approach, was seen as a where scripture was seen as a series of theological proof texts, often interpreted in the light of later ecclesiastical statements, while the impressionistic approach worked more with the blessed thoughts that the passage of scripture might excite in the minds of the readers. It is fair to say that at a popular level, both of these kinds of interpretation were often used. Think of sermons you heard at that time. By contrast, the grammatical historical method takes seriously the fact that the Bible is a book from a particular historical setting and consists of words in the original languages. So genuine interpretation must take account of that setting and attempt to understand the text using all possible resources that will explain the wording. The scripture must be understood on its own terms. But now in commending the grammatical historical method, Martin was probably at the same time distancing himself from the so-called historical critical method, which was the dominant approach in biblical scholarship at that time. Now, grammatical historical and historical critical may sound very similar, and the latter method would have used the same tools 
as the former. But as formulated by scholars such as the German Ernst Trelsch, the historical critical method was based on a denial of the supernatural and attempted to understand the biblical text as simply a human and fallible collection of documents. As a consequence, historical criticism in the broad sense was viewed with disfavor, and that's a mild word for it, by evangelicals. They believe its presuppositions were invalid, and therefore its conclusions must be false. And so they were tempted to reject it lock, stock, and barrel. They were wary of a method which seemed to thrive on discovering errors, discovering errors and contradictions in the Bible and building theories upon them. And underlying all this, there was the recognition that the method was spiritually barren, because it seemed to be more concerned with exploring how texts came into existence, rather than with elucidating their theological significance. Students walked out of theological seminaries with the feeling that they had learned very little that would help them to preach from Scripture. I've heard them say it. To cite a favorite example, the documentary theory of the origins of the Pentateuch was regarded with great disfavor because A, it denied the mosaic authorship of Genesis, which it was assumed was asserted in the Bible. B, to a considerable extent, it based the dissection of the narrative into different sections from different sources on the exposure of discrepancies and contradictions between the different texts and see it tended to ignore the divine authority of the text. More recent criticism of it from a wider constituency than the evangelical one has also claimed that in principle the method could not bring out the message of the Bible for today. Maybe the reason for this was that it didn't try to do so. And yet a great deal of biblical study was conducted in that manner. Faced by the prevalence of this general approach, evangelicals reacted in a couple of ways. First, there were scholars who attempted to deal with the problems of this kind by taking on the critics on their own ground, producing reasoned refutations of their theories and framing better ones. Among scholars who did so might be mentioned the Dutch scholar G.C. Alders, whose book, A Short Introduction to the Pentateuch, kept me going during my student days, along with G.T. Manley, British scholar, The Book of the Law. But towering above them all, and when I discovered it, was a genuine <coughs> fiction on the New Testament, The Virgin Birth of Christ, which came to my rescue after a series of seminars in Germany back in 1959. I thought I could still celebrate Christmas. <laughs> now, the point to be emphasized is that whether or not these evangelical scholars were right in their historical conclusions, they recognized the need for scholarly historical <coughs> study of the issues. But secondly, probably the majority of evangelicals simply took refuge in their belief in scriptural infallibility and declared whatever the critics might say, biblical statements about the authorship of the books, or well, the forecasts made in predictive prophecy were by definition historically infallible. So many interpreters simply ignored the higher critics, as they called them, and their conclusions. <coughs> and there was a consequent distrust of scholarship of any, of any kind. So for a long time, there was very little serious evangelical scholarship. Evangelical candidates for ministry were sometimes encouraged by their elders not to take theological degrees, lest they should be infected with hypothesis and lose their faith. So the Alan Stibbs have been told that, and I think John Stott was as well. But as for actual interpretation of the text, the evangelical scholars followed, followed the practices of their time. Essentially, exegesis itself was carried on perfectly properly by linguistic and syntactical study to discover what the text was saying. Background information would be drawn upon to explain it. But there was a tendency to spread, to spend most of the time in elucidating the details of the text 
verse by verse, rather than looking at larger units of text and their total thrust. For those of us who were students at the time, the publication of the series of Tyndale New Testament commentaries was an absolute godsend. But even then, I think I was becoming aware that in some cases, there was insufficient attention to the structure of the biblical books and to the elucidation of their theology. The next point is that it was assumed that the text would speak to the modern reader, more or less as it stood. So there was literally no need for interpretation in the sense of reapplying the text to different circumstances or translating it to make it intelligible to people living in a different situation. For the most part, it could be assumed that there was little or no difference between the original readers and the contemporary readers. And it may be significant that even in our 1977 symposium, out of 18 essays, only one was directly concerned with the question of how you expand the text for the modern reader. So we have a situation in which, despite the exceptions I've mentioned, there was little or no scholarship, evangelicalism was largely defensive, and hermeneutics was not seen as a problem. It would be fair to say that at the center of such discussion as there was, there lay the questions of authorship and historicity, since these issues were most germane to the authenticity and authority of the biblical texts. But then came several books, such as the symposium I've just mentioned. What has caused the change? Over the past 50 years or so, there has been a remarkable growth <coughs> in the industry of biblical scholarship on all sides. And in particular, there has been a tremendous interest in hermeneutics or interpretation, again in the broadest sense, and by scholars of all persuasions. There have also been some welcome shifts in scholarship, three of which are of particular significance. First, there has been the recognition that the biblical books are all, in different degrees, theological documents. And therefore, one of the main aims, if not the main aim of interpretation, should be to elucidate the theology. A number of major series of commentaries have made that their explicit aim. And once that fact is it follows that attention must be directed to the message of the Bible. At the same time, there's been a recognition that texts should be studied in their own right as literary entities. And that has led to a concentration on the texts in their final form and to a lessening of interest in how they came to be, their origins. For example, earlier studies of Matthew and Luke tended to look at them redactionally, asking how did the authors use their sources. But nowadays, however, the current impasse in solving the synoptic problem has led to a shift and to asking how did the evangelists tell their stories? And narrative criticism and discourse analysis have tended to replace source criticism and redaction criticism. And most of the recent developments in new approaches have tended to be towards <coughs> more literary approaches as opposed to historical ones. And thirdly, there has also developed a so-called canonical criticism, which insists that books should be interpreted not only in their final form, but also as part of a canonical collection of scripture. And this has led us back to something rather like the old principle of interpreting scripture by scripture. Now these three developments mean that biblical scholarship in general is concentrating on areas that are more congenial to evangelicals. Now we're inevitably influenced by our context and the development of evangelical biblical scholarship over this period must be understood at least to some extent against this broader background of a more positive approach. Alongside these developments in scholarship at large, which have been congenial to evangelical study, there's also a shift within evangelicalism. 
And this is the recognition on the part of many, but not all scholars, that the methods of critical study can be used without acceptance of the anti-religious presuppositions that rule out the possibility of the supernatural and spiritual experience from the start. It is possible to do grammatical historical study without accepting the starting point laid down by Trunch. Over against the skeptical historical critical method may be placed the approach sometimes called believing criticism. Let me comment in passing that this has led to some diversity in critical stances, although that's not a new phenomenon. In the 1940s, there took place in Britain the creation of the Tyndale Fellowship, which I've already mentioned. This was a serious attempt to develop an evangelical scholarship which could face up to the challenges of biblical criticism honestly and fairly. And writing in 1947, one of its leading founder members, F.F. F. Bruce, contrasted the then attitude, the then attitude of the Roman Catholic Church, which fettered its scholars, to that of the Tyndale Fellowship. He said, in such critical crusades, for example, as the codification of the Pentateuch, the composition of Isaiah, the faith of Daniel, the sources of the Gospels, or the authenticity of the pastoral epistles, each of us is free to hold and to proclaim the conclusions to which all the available evidence points. Any research worthy of the name we take it for granted must necessarily be unfettered. Now it must be admitted that Bruce's statement represented the ideal rather than what was always the reality. Evangelical publishers in particular have not always been willing to publish views which were out of tune with their own ideas or those of their constituency and the very real fear that they would lose sales and lose their customers. We may compare the contemporary <coughs> reaction, said he dangerously, to proposed provisions in the new international version of the scriptures by those who fear that it would give support to egalitarian views of the place of women in the home and the ministry. This led to the American Bible Society retracting from its intentions. Their solution, worthy of Solomon, of course, is to continue to publish the unrevised NIV to satisfy one part of the constituency, and to publish a revised version under a different name for the benefit of the remainder of it, called today's New International Version. I hope this was not meant to mean that those thinking to the older version had embraced yesterday's International Version. But there we are. Now it's evident that the problems of pressure by people with clout on publishers and censorship by publishers themselves have not gone away one of my marginal points would be about the need for evangelical scholars to be able to publish views that may be novel and even questionable so that they can be discussed by their peers without the proponents being censored or being drummed out of the party. To some extent, then, getting back to the point, there's been a rapprochement between scholars of a more conservative and a more liberal bent in much recent study. This has taken place, as I'm saying, because the study of biblical texts has tended to be conducted on the level of texts as literary, literary objects, rather than on the level of texts as witnesses to historical events. And that type of study doesn't raise the disputed questions of historicity and sources and so on that were a major battleground in the past. But there are, of course, dangers in conducting literary study apart from historical study. And one of them is the temptation to explain the text purely on the literary level. I think of one attempt to explain Luke's portrayal of women in the early church, simply in terms of Luke's particular motivation, rather than recognizing that Luke was constrained by the historical phenomena that he was describing. Now, evangelicals have an important role to play here in stressing the relation of the texts to the historical events that underlie them. There can also be the danger of ignoring the historical questions and sticking to the less controversial issues. 
present, for example, much less attention is being paid to questions of the sources of the books of the Old Testament. And preference is given to study of the books as completed wholes, however they reach that state. Now this emphasis on the final form of the text is certainly to be welcomed. But the question of history cannot be sidestepped forever. And evangelicals would want to insist that if the text does not witness to a genuine saving and judging intervention of God in human history, then we are, of all people, most miserable. So emerging from these considerations, it would seem that evangelical scholars are more open to the scholarly study of the text, using whatever scholarly tools are available, even if this means that there's less unanimity of issues of authorship and historicity. Now, in the light of these remarks, let me note briefly what's been taking place. And I'll do so in terms of the three levels of discussion that I mentioned right at the outset. First, evangelical scholars have both welcomed and forwarded, forwarded the developments in general hermeneutics that have been taking place in recent years. Some of the most important contributions in this area have been made by Roger Lundin, Tony Thistleton, and Kevin Van Cusen, And these have attracted wide attention. A wider discussion led by Craig Bartholomew in Britain and involving scholars from a variety of theological stables is taking place in the Scripture and Hermeneutics Seminar, which at the time of this lecture has produced two volumes of papers and responses to them, and a third volume is scheduled for later this, this fall. Then second, approaches to the text, specific procedures. Here it's interesting to compare two textbooks for students. The first the one I've already mentioned, which I myself edited 25 years ago, and this is what it covered, among other things. Semantics, introduction, meaning matters of authorship, readership, and date, and the like. Religious background, <laughs> historical criticism, source criticism, form criticism, tradition history, redaction criticism, genre, and use of the Old Testament. Exegesis itself was covered by an article which looked at two difficult passages and explored how you go about understanding them. And a further article and exposition looked at these same two passages and how one draws significance out of them for today. All of these approaches were recognized as legitimate and necessary and valuable for understanding the text. Now, over against that, placed the much more recent book called Hearing the New Testament, Strategies for Interpretation, edited by Joel Green, which appeared um, just two or three years ago. Its list of topics includes Traditio Historical Criticism, Historical Criticism and Social Scientific Perspectives, The Relevance of Extra Canonical Jewish Texts, The Relevance of Greek or Roman Literature and Culture, Textual Criticism, Modern Linguistics, Discourse Analysis, Genre analysis, the use of the Old Testament, narrative criticism, rhetorical criticism, the place of the reader in New Testament interpretation, feminist hermeneutics, and reading the New Testament in canonical context. There are two things that are impressive here. The first of them is the number of approaches to the New Testament study in the second volume which were only beginning to be heard of in 1977, or which had not developed sufficiently far to be thought worthy of mention. So, while there's always been recognition of the need to look at the Jewish and the non-Jewish texts of the period to shed fuller light on the New Testament, new tools, such as computerized texts and search procedures, and new discoveries, like the availability of the full corpus of the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in the, in the library in Pasadena. These have revolutionized this area. But there are also the new types of analysis of the text, discourse analysis, rhetorical criticism, and reader response criticism that have now come to the fore and made us ask new questions of the text. Now, all this 
type of questioning is legitimate and useful, provided it's not driven by the motive of discrediting the text <coughs> and is not regarded as the key to all our problems. And when I talk about discrediting the text, I'm thinking of those who practice deconstruction. <coughs> or destructions, it might be better called. <laughs> now, the second point is not simply that evangelical scholars have taken up these approaches, but that in a number of cases, they have made important contributions to their development. Let me just mention one or two, from, um, particularly. Among the more traditional approaches is the outstanding work of Bruce Metzger in establishing the text of the Greek New Testament. The pioneer work of Edmund A. Judge, an Australian scholar, in developing a social scientific approach to the New Testament is widely esteemed. Some of the most important work in the study of Greek syntax have been carried out by Stan Porter, Lewis Fanning, and Dan Wallace. The work of Joel Green himself in developing a literary approach to the study of the Gospel of Luke has been very favorably received by many reviewers. Here at last, says Gordon Fee, is a commentary on Luke that tries to come to read it to see how the narrative works. And several of the contributors to Green's symposium are making their mark as front runners in these new approaches. Thirdly, the fruits of this study are being seen in the commentaries being produced by evangelical scholars, such series as the New International Commentary on the New Testament, the New International Greek Testament Commentary, the word biblical commentary and the pillar commentaries bear testimony to this level of activity at the present time. So at the level of exegesis of the text, evangelical scholars are playing an important role in the development and the application of methods of study. Work of this kind is based on the axiom that all interpretation of the text must begin with the attempt to understand it as clearly as possible in terms of its original setting. <coughs> There's much debate as to whether there can be such a thing as unbiased exegesis, or whether we are not all of us unconsciously affected by the presuppositions that we bring to the study of the text. Maybe in principle it is impossible the modern readers to discover what Mark was trying to say or what his first century readers would have got out of his text. But I'm not so pessimistic about that point. The point about the impossibility of presuppositionless exegesis must be admitted. But don't let us exaggerate its significance. We must beware of a fallacious argument which says if you cannot draw an exact boundary at every point, then it follows that there isn't a boundary and or that it cannot be traced. There's a clear distinction between the land and the sea, even if the sea comes in and goes out and leaves the boundary between them a little bit uncertain. So granted that absolute objectivity may be impossible to achieve, it simply does not follow that a relative objectivity must be unattainable. In fact, exegetes may come out of many different cultures and times. And when there is agreement among so many different people about the, both the methods to be employed and to a considerable extent on the conclusions that can be reached, then we may be reasonably sure that we are within sight of a valid exegesis. Some areas are obviously more factual than others. I would argue that in the spheres of Greek lexicography and grammar, we have a very solid basis indeed of reasonably certain knowledge. More controversially, I would claim the same for studies of the reconstruction of the original text of the Greek New Testament. And many aspects of the actual interpretation of the text are generally agreed, even though commentators continue to argue and to debate with one another. Well, they've got to debate with one another to get their books published and to keep themselves in a living. So it only goes. <laughs> So we've got a fairly sound starting point for the third part of the task of interpretation to which I now come, the application of the text. Possibly the most important and controversial issue to be discussed is that of the application of the text, my level three 
How do we read and appropriate ancient texts in the contemporary world? For a typical answer, we may turn to Jim Packer in an essay entitled Understanding the Bible, Evangelical Hermeneutics, originally published in 1990. It begins by expressing the distinctive character of evangelical hermeneutics on the basis, and I'll quote, Evangelicals say that they should listen to Holy Scripture and finally let its teaching guide them, however much reordering of their prior ideas and intentions this may involve, and however sharply it may set them at odds with the mindset of their peers and their times. Then we state four principles that govern the interpretation. Number one, biblical passages must be taken to mean what their human authors were consciously expressing. For what the human authors say is what God says. Second, the coherence, harmony, and veracity of all biblical teaching must be taken as a working hypothesis interpretation. Thirdly, Interpretation involves synthesizing what the various biblical passages teach. <coughs> but each item taught finds its proper place and significance in the organism of Revelation as a whole. Under this heading, Packer then comments that progressive revelation is not an evolutionary <coughs> process of growing spiritual discernment through which cruder notions come to be left behind. Rather, in his words, earlier revelation became the foundation for later revelation. And fourthly, the response for which the text calls must be made explicit. Here the crucial procedure comes out. I get a quote. So he says, just as it is possible to identify in all the books of scripture <coughs> universal and abiding truths about the will work and ways of God, it is equally possible to find in every one of them universal and abiding principles of loyalty and devotion to the holy gracious creator, and then to detach these from the particular situations to which, and the cultural frames within which the books apply them, and to reapply them to ourselves in the places, circumstances, and conditions of our own lives today. He goes on, rational application of this kind, acknowledging but transcending cultural differences between the Bible worlds and ours, is a stock in trade of the evangelical pulpit, and the recognized goal of the evangelical discipline of personal meditation on the written text. Evangelicals do not find their models of interpretation in the critical commentaries of the last century and a half which stop short of offering historical explanations of the text and have no applicatory angle at all, they find them rather in the from faith to faith expository styles of older writers who concern themselves with what scripture means as God's word to their own readers, as well as with what it meant as religious instruction for the readership originally addressed, and whose supreme skill lay in making appropriate applications of the material that they exegeted by grammatical historical means. So that's such a long sentence, but I didn't write it. <laughs> now, similar statements might have been taken from several sources. But what Packer says here is representative of an agreed position. He makes a distinction there between what we may call statements of doctrine and principles of response to God. The former, it seems, are accepted as they stand, these statements of doctrine. But it is recognized that the forms in which the latter are presented, the responses, may be shaped by particular situations, like go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, right? Off you go to Nineveh. Or by cultural frameworks, let people and animals be covered with sackcloth that everyone calls urgently on God, so run out and get some sackcloth and put it on your dog and your cat and on yourself. Jonah. 
we are required to detach the principles of response to God's message from the specific forms in which they're given, and then to make a rational reapplication of themselves, of them to ourselves, in our situation and cultural setting. So we may not go to Nineveh because it's long since dead, and we may have to go to Baghdad or Tehran or wherever else. And we may not put sackcloth upon us, but we will express our repentance to God in other ways. Well, there we've got a hermeneutical procedure that sounds all right, and it commands fairly wide assent, and it's commonly practiced. But does it solve all our problems? Let me be a little critical on it. First of all, it doesn't always lead to the same results, even among interpreters who may be presumed to be living in much the same kind of setting. Fifty years ago, there was virtual agreement among evangelicals in confining the ordained ministry and church leadership to men. But today there is no longer such agreement. Or again, the practice of apartheid, which was based on a particular understanding of the teaching of Scripture by Christians who professed to be reformed Christians. That understanding has been recognized as incompatible with scriptural teaching. On matters of doctrine, there are important questions regarding the nature of justice and judgment, and consequently regarding the understanding of atonement. And whereas evangelicals tended to adopt in practice a supersessionist understanding of certain gifts of the Spirit, particularly speaking in tongues, prophecy and healing, there's been a revival of these gifts in charismatic congregations, accompanied by a reappraisal of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Then second, there's a further set of problems where the Christian is called upon to deal with contemporary issues to which there is nothing closely analogous in Scripture or in the ancient world generally. I'm thinking of the typical issues raised by what scientific and medical term technology, <coughs> questions of fertilization, contraception, genetic modification, termination of life. How do you use scripture in these cases? And the preaching ministry, which always starts from the text of scripture and expounds that text, is in grave danger of never reaching such problems, the solution of which may depend upon the thrust of scripture as a whole, rather than upon a single passage. And yet another area arises with more general issues of human life. Christians today would very probably campaign against slavery or unrepresentative government. Although these are not questioned in scripture, and people are apparently encouraged to live obediently within the, the existing social and political frameworks, and are never encouraged to campaign towards fundamental changes in the structures of society and the state. When we get the principle, we must obey God rather than human beings in Acts 5, that appears to apply only where the human authorities forbid Christian witness. So how do Christians justify civil rights movements, peaceful protests, and so on? So there's a broad range of questions where adoption of the method doesn't necessarily lead to unanimity in interpretation. These problems arise at the levels of exegesis of individual texts, constructing a synthesis or harmony of biblical teaching, and making a rational application of the biblical teaching. So it's not surprising, therefore, that evangelicals, like other Christians, are examining afresh the ways in which we appropriate the message of Scripture for ourselves, or better, to find out how we can tell what God is telling us to believe and to do in Scripture. <coughs> and these problems are concerned not just with the application of principles, but also in some cases with the states of the principles themselves. So the scope of the method is limited. But there are also some problems with the method itself. First, while Packer's approach is clearly designed to outlaw various untenable forms of allegorical interpretation, it's not clear to me that his stress on what the human writers intended to explain 
can do justice to what is sometimes called the sensus plenior, the fuller sense that texts may have as a result of their divine inspiration or their place in the wider history of salvation and the development of the canon. 1 Peter 1, 10-12, for example, suggests that writers may have written texts that contained more than they themselves could understand, since the reference of their prophecies was not always clear to them. So the confinement of the message of the scriptures to what the human writers intended to say seems to me to fall short. Then secondly, while the assumption that scripture is the word of God and therefore truthful is crucial for evangelicals, it can be assumed in advance what that assumption means in detail. Does it, for example, mean that a story that appears to us to be told as if it were a narrative of what actually happened is a historical account in the sense that every detail happened just as it is related? What about the story of Jonah? which might be a short story making important theological points rather than, rather than a historical account. And when it's said that the account is coherent, is that going to be true always at the surface level or perhaps only at a deeper level? How do we deal with apparent contradictions in Scripture, not just factual ones, but teaching ones? Thirdly, Problems also arise when teaching is given, particularly in the Old Testament, which seems to some of us to be more like cruder notions to be abandoned, rather than the foundation for later revelation, the divine approval expressed or tacit of genocide in certain situations, as the obvious and very worrying example. And fourthly, I have no problem at all with the important statement that the interpretation of Scripture is meant to to lead to a response from the readers. But more needs to be said about what kind of responses are required. Now, I recognize the danger of giving a false impression that in the brief section I quoted, Packer has not tackled any of my questions more fully um, in other places. But even so, I'm sure he would agree that he hasn't spoken the last word on the problem, and we must go on debating these issues. So what I want to do in what remains is to open up the question of how we get back from the Bible to Christian doctrine and practice in the contemporary world. Or how we get back to the Bible from our contemporary questions and problems in belief and behavior. But let me conclude this first installment of my remarks, the first hopeful thing I've said, by noting two other acceptable ways of proceeding. <coughs> First, evangelicals are generally clear that they ought not to go down the path of classical liberalism, by which I understand the peeling off of those aspects of Christian faith and ethics which are unacceptable to modern, or perhaps we now ought to say postmodern people. It's recognized that such trimming of the faith subjects the Bible to the changing arbitrary shifts of contemporary opinion and rests on no firm principles. But at the same time, we cannot dismiss the approach of liberalism just like that. And I shall want to return later to the challenge with which it confronts us. Later, hopefully, of course, means tomorrow or the day after. Secondly, it may not be so clear, perhaps, to some evangelicals that we ought not to go down the route of fundamentalism one of the results of the search of contemporary fundamentalisms in different types of religion and even in politics has been a closer scrutiny of its nature. It's been shown that in many cases, what is going on is not simply the appeal to an authoritative text whose interpretation lies beyond question, but rather the buttressing of the authority of a human leader or leaders who so identify themselves with a policy that they justify from the sacred text that they consider challenging their authority is a challenge to the authority of the text. Or perhaps we should say that what they are upholding is a particular tradition of interpretation which is taken to be authoritative and beyond question. But in fact, such interpretations 
are usually just one possibility. Usually a superficially obvious and attractive one to its supporters. And the text is being used as an instrument to force obedience to the human authority. So, for example, the Sharia or Sharia law in Islam is but one interpretation of the Quran. But to disagree with it in certain sects of Islam is, in fact, to disagree with the Ayatollahs. We shall therefore need to ask whether sometimes, I'm not saying always, sometimes fundamentalism is a defense of a post post-biblical, traditional interpretation, rather than a willingness to be led by the text. Now, in place of those two extremes, the liberal extreme and the fundamentalist extreme, we need an interpretation of the Bible that is determined by the Bible itself, if such a thing be possible. So what I want to propose is that we look for ways of interpreting the Bible which will themselves be biblical. And what I'm going to do in the two remaining lectures is to make a start in asking whether such a thing is possible, and if so, what it might look like. But you'll have to come again tomorrow or the next night to find out. Thank you.